Greetings and salutations and a big warm welcome back to another episode of the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Neil C. Hughes, and today we're going to venture into the fascinating intersection of AI, blockchain, and gaming. And joining me today is a trailblazer in this space. He's a co-founder of Parallel, which is a studio that's redefining gaming norms with innovative AI integrations. They've already birthed a unique concept named Colony, which is a groundbreaking blend of AI elements reminiscent of Tamagotchi and large language models. But this isn't just a game, it's more of an AI-driven experience where your avatar evolves autonomously, weaving its memories and biography into the gameplay, often with unexpected twists. So, Parallel is not just about gaming, it's an approach that encompasses Web3, NFTs, showcasing how these technologies can enhance the overall gaming experience. And I just loved how they're pioneering this community-first strategy a testament to the potential of collaborative development in tech. And that is why I've invited them on the podcast today. So we're going to delve into the future of blockchain and Web3 and gaming, areas where Parallel is undoubtedly leading the charge. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Toronto, where we're going to explore the depths of AI, blockchain and gaming, and also how these technologies are not just shaping virtual worlds, but also influencing our understanding of technology's role in entertainment and beyond. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? Sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Koji. I am the head of game development and design at uh, Parallel Studios. Uh, at Parallel, we make games that feature blockchain technology and the game that we are working on right now for the most part, is a game called Parallel, which is a uh, digital TCG. Uh, for the uninitiated, that just essentially means it's a trading card game. So if you've ever played anything like Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh! or Magic the Gathering, you probably have a sense of what we're doing, but we're doing it digitally and using the blockchain for ownership. Uh, one of the things that put you guys on my radar was you're integrating both AI and blockchain in gaming. So just to set the scene for our conversation today, especially for people outside of this space, can you just give me a bit of an overview of how Parallel is integrating AI and blockchain technologies into gaming and, and what unique experiences does this integration ultimately create for the players and developers? Okay, yeah. I mean, you're weaseling it out of me because I did mention that we are mainly working on a TCG, but one of our uh, more ambitious projects is a game called Colony. Yeah. And essentially what we're doing is building... Uh, the, the phrase I've coined is a one and a half player game. Essentially, you and an AI team up together uh, to run life in a colony and uh, hopefully defend yourself against the uh, trials and tribulations of living in that colony and other colonies. Uh, the way that we've integrated AI is um, the, the, each player gets assigned an AI uh, we call them uh, the colonists, and and your colonist, your agent, uh, is actually the player of the game, and you're sort of there to direct it. So if, if you could imagine yourself as your character's super ego, you know, uh, the AI is going to come to you, the colonist is going to come to you with questions, and you're going to answer those questions, and based on uh, the back and forward, it's going to make decisions. But part of the game is trying to direct your colonist to do things that's best for them, best for the colony, and, and best for you as a player. But the other part of it is sort of building that relationship so that you can learn to trust each other and understand each other and work together. Uh, so, uh, you know, I like to say it's one part Tamagotchi, one part uh, black and white. If you've ever played that game, I might be dating myself. And, uh, you know, maybe one part The Sims in a futuristic sci-fi world. Uh, there, it's a, it gets way more complicated than that. We also have a few other AI that help govern the game. So... We have what we call the Dungeon Master AI, and its primary role is to decide whether or not things should exist in the game and then create those things if it determines they should exist. And by that, I mean, uh, you know, I'll give you a story. So in one of our testing phases, uh, one of our colonists said, um, notice that everyone in the colony was feeling a little bit depressed because we have meters for happiness and health and all that stuff. Uh, notice that it, it was in a decline. And uh, one of the players said to their colonist, 
you know, when I was a kid, it, it told this whole story about uh, how their mother used to brew them mint tea. And of course, uh, we didn't program in mint tea to the game. We didn't have any concept of it or mint, but we did have like a garden area where people could grow things. And so this particular colonist went to the shop and said, I'd like to buy mint seeds. And behind the scenes, the Dungeon Master AI said, you know what? I feel like that's something that could exist in this world, in this game. So let's allow the the user to create it. Uh, or sorry, the AI to create it. The AI created it, sold it to the colonist. The colonist planted it, created uh, mint leaves, brewed those mint leaves into mint tea. And then again, in the background, the mint tea was assigned stats. So, you know, plus five happiness, plus three health, that sort of thing. And then from that point forward, mint tea existed in the game. So, um, not only is AI being used to interact with the players and give the characters life, but it's also being used to um, almost program itself. You know, it's writing its own JSON code in order to make these things exist in game for future iterations. Wow, that's an incredible story. I'm fascinated by it. I love how you're also blending aspects of the, the Tamago Tamagotchi kind of thing with a large language model. So how does it all work if we were to take a, a look under the hood? And what would you say makes it stand out in the AI gaming landscape. How does it all work? I mean, uh, that's, <laughs> for, that's probably an episode for, on its own, right? <laughs> yeah, honestly, it's probably for a bigger brain than me, uh, truthfully. But, uh, you know, essentially we have various AIs governing various areas of the game. So like I said, each player is uh, assigned uh, its own AI with its own memories um, that is the player in the game. So you know, as an example, if you told your AI, hey, uh, cut work today and go sit in the bar and, and talk people up, um, you know, that if it has a positive effect on on the on the outcome for the AI, it's going to remember that. And maybe next time on its own, it's going to skip work and start talking to people at the bar. And if it has a negative effect, it may, you know, think twice about listening to some of your advice the next time around. Uh you know, like I said, we also have the Dungeon Master AI, which helps determine whether or not things should exist in the game and and um, and write those things. But basically, we've we've trained the the um, player AIs uh, with memories on the world that we've built for Parallel. So the story of Parallel, um, what views it would have in Parallel. There are five different factions. So uh, your AI would belong to one of those five factions, and what memories it may have belonging to one of those five factions there's also a questionnaire when you first start the game about you know the type of person you'd you'd want to be paired with um and so the ai is, is trained with that sort of thing and then the, the dungeon master ai is, is trained more strictly with the the rules of the game the strictures of the world so again it can determine whether or not something should exist and if it does determine that thing should exist uh what that then looks like in game it assigns stats to it um how you know, the, the frequency of it, the rarity of it, all that sort of thing. And then, of course, uh, uh, these things are created on a colony by colony basis. We then, as the, the game creators, go into the back end, have a look at the things that have been created for, you know, colony A. And if we like them, we say, okay, yes, it can exist for colonies B, C, D, E, and F, etc. And if we don't like them, we either determine whether or not we actually want it to exist in the game. And if we do, whether or not the stats that have been assigned to it need to change in order for balance to, you know, be achieved in game. But that's basically the process. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, you really do. I'm, you just opened up a whole box of curiosity in me here. So, I mean, you've been in this game for some time now. How are you seeing AI tools enhancing coding and workflow processes behind the scenes? A lot is happening at a rapid pace right now, isn't it? Yeah, I mean... It, it, it's doing a lot, right? So uh, on one hand, you can use it as sort of an inspirational tool. So, you know, you, if you have an idea for something, you can feed it into AI, see what comes out the other end, and then either modify it or based on that, do your own thing. Our our, our um, use of it, I think, though, is, it, is what interests me, is that, uh, you know, we want this game to have uh, a very immersive feel and we, we want the player to discover new things that haven't existed prior. And in fact, as a game designer, it's most exciting to, for me to see where the players go and what they discover. And uh, the fact that some of it's still a mystery to me. And by that, I mean, 
because we are allowing the AI to uh, essentially write its own code and, and add things to the game, it gives us insight into um, what the players want to do and the player psyche. So I'll, I'll give you another example, right? The game at first was about um, mining and building the colony. But we noticed that um, rather than, uh, I mean, they, they, those elements are still there, but rather than just engaging in the, in the building and mining and resource management part of it, players were obsessed with uh, interacting with their AI and having their AI interact with, with the other uh, AI wandering around. And so there was a social element to it that um, hadn't existed prior. And so the AI was sort of nudging us in that direction. But we also got an insight to see, okay, this is actually what the players want to do in this sandbox. And so maybe we should focus a bit more time on that. And that led us down the path of, okay, well, now let's let the, uh, you know, rather than competing for resources, let's just let the the colonies maybe wage war against each other because they really want to interact with each other on a colony by colony basis. And um, the AI itself has given us a bit of a shorthand. We, we, can, we can build the system show the AI the system and say, okay, let the colonies run wild and let's see what happens. And we can iterate, like we can, we can let it run for a while, see what the outcome is. And if it's, if it's like completely busted again, we don't, we don't need to start from scratch and redesign. We can pare down what it's come up with to something that's manageable and it makes the development process that much faster. And another thing that made you stand out to me was your community first approach to to both game and tech development across parallel and again opens up a whole world of curiosity in me so how does that approach shape your projects and also what kind of impact is it having on your audience engagement what are you seeing well uh before i get into that let me just tell you the this the initial story of parallel okay so yeah uh in in covid me and a bunch of my buddies got together and we were playing games to to keep up with one another so you know we'd be playing Call of Duty or Apex or Hearthstone, and we'd be on on mic with each other in these games, talking to each other the same way that people might on the on a telephone. And at one point, we decided, hey, we want to build a game. But it, it, it's not as if we we started as a game company, uh, had all these resources, and were, decided to make a game. We just had this idea. You know, we had some. Uh, luckily, Oscar Mar, the great Oscar Mar, was at our disposal, and he created some art for us to show off what we intended to do and what we did initially was we we took 15 of uh, of what would be our cards put them up online said here's the art for the game here are the rules for the game that we want to make um and how we want to play it if enough people buy these nfts uh we will make this game and so essentially from our from our very inception it's been a community driven project because um, if we didn't have enough people buy in at the beginning, we wouldn't have been able to, to to make the game or get where we are now. And so every step of the way, it's always been about how do we involve the community in this process, you know, and, and that doesn't, um, I mean, it sounds a little bit difficult because there's all these disparate opinions, you know, and not people don't always know what's, what's best for them. But I will say that the, 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 the positive outcomes uh, greatly outweigh the negative. And by that, I mean, just like people are 100% uh, on board and involved in what we're doing. We see a lot more, um, I don't know, rigorous community. Um, uh, I don't, I want to th think of a word that's greater than involvement because, yeah. you know, they're there helping, uh, helping steer us along the way. In fact, we, at one point early on in the process, we stood up a community organization known as Echelon that now governs the token involved in the games that we've uh that we're building um and it's com completely community run so you know the community's been a big part uh in our process and um also whenever we have you know things for sale or we ask for testing or whatever they're always there to support us it's not they're not fair weather so uh the the beauty is that um you know, because they're so entrenched in what we're doing and they're helping us build, um, they're just going to always be there for us when we need something. And, and it's uh, it, it's an amazing thing, honestly. Like, we wouldn't be where we are without them. Love what you've created here. And, and as a thought leader in this Web3 space, I would ask you to uh, 
have a little peek into my virtual crystal ball here. We are at that time of the year where people are making predictions for the future. So any predictions on the future of blockchain and Web3 and gaming and, and how you might see these technologies evolving or even converging in the gaming industry ahead? Okay. I mean, that's an interesting question. I think that um, I'm going to go with my optimist prediction here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and by that, I mean, uh, I think that what we're going to see is simplification of the technology. I, I, Whenever I talk to people about blockchain, especially when it comes to gaming, but in general, it's just a piece of backend tech, right? Uh, when games are built correctly, you don't you don't see the databases running in the background. You know, you don't look at a game and you don't think you don't think to yourself that's a SQL game. You know, um, you know, and if it's written in C plus plus, you're not like that's a C plus plus game. You just play the game, uh, and the technology enables you to have a an enriched experience. And then I think in the future, what we're going to see is more and more obfuscation of Web three as a technology. And it's just going to be something that allows players to do things like have ownership, verify things on chain, you know, an open uh, economy. All that stuff is just going to become part and parcel of playing these games, but you're not going to realize you're doing it. Right now, there's so much barrier to entry and it's so confusing that, you know, the average person is either afraid to do it or is going to make some mistakes along the way. I think that eventually we're going to see uh more adoption when we see uh you know easier less friction uh going forward and i I suspect that that's what's gonna happen in the future we've seen it with every other technology right like at one point email was uh what we used to you know write a pen pal it wasn't something that we would use to transact business with and now it's like no brainer okay okay of course we're sending emails for business purposes you can docu sign things digitally you don't need to um you know uh, sign with ink and then mail it, snail mail it to somebody, uh, and that's because as uh, the there's less and less friction and there's more and more adoption, we begin to trust this stuff a bit more, um, and it becomes more robust. And I think that's going to be the future for Web three. Yeah, when you say that about remembering email, do you remember the CompuServe emails back in the day? How complicated they were. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. I, I will. I mean, just think about the, the friction that you used to have to to get onto the internet to begin with, right? Like you'd have to be paying a provider. You'd only have a certain amount of minutes. You'd have to log in each time. It would like be a, a modem phone call. The whole thing was like insane. Now you just turn on your computer and you're online. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. And again, looking towards the future, are there any major challenges or equally opportunities that you've encountered while? integrating AI and blockchain and gaming at parallel? Because I, I suspect you've been on quite a journey, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's equal part um, opportunity and, and you know, roadblocks along the way. And uh, that happens when uh, you're kind of on the, on the cutting edge of things. So, like, the opportunity is uh, the emergent sort of be- behaviors that you see with AI. So, like, you know, I mentioned the Mint Tea thing. I'll tell you another little quick anecdote. There was a a game where um, the player and its AI were getting along and the player was just spamming in chat, like, do this, do this, do this, do this. And, and the AI kept saying, no, 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 because they thought it was a bad idea. And eventually the AI just stopped what it was doing, went to the med bay and said to the doctor, I need help. And the doctor said, like, what's the problem? And he says, I hear voices in my head and they won't stop. And that fourth wall breaking behavior was like so amazing to me. It opened my eyes to what's possible, you know, and, and, and that sort of thing is like unbelievable. You don't, you won't see that kind of thing in other games because all of those responses are pre-programmed. Right. And so uh, I think that like the, the upside is like, you can get insane things that no one ever predicted would happen. Now the, the, the roadblock is when building games like this, there's no template, Right. If I were even building our card game, right, I can look at what's come before and what the things that I like and don't like about those games and adjust accordingly. Same with if I was building a shooter, you know, the things that I like and don't like about those games and adjust accordingly. But when you add in um, the type of game that we're trying to build is, is, is net new and you're, the responses are unpredictable, how do you, um, you know, rein in that kind of game? That's a huge challenge. But if, if we can solve it, and I think we are solving it, then, you know, we're going to have a net new, ex- extraordinarily fun, extraordinarily interesting experience. 
And I'm conscious we will have a lot of aspiring tech entrepreneurs listening, startup founders. So based on your uh, diverse experience, what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs looking to innovate in the tech industry or the gaming industry? Any any advice that you would pass down to them? I mean, the biggest piece of advice um, that I, I would pass down, and I think that um, this is true uh, of any venture, is don't worry about the details when you're first starting. I mean, uh, the hardest thing to do uh, when it comes to being an entrepreneur is is just to get moving. Once you have momentum, you can gain momentum and you can figure out the details. But you can obsess over the details uh, before you get started and say, oh, if I just figure this out, then then I'll get going. Or, you know, I have to check these three things off my list and then the company will really get going. Like, no, no, no. What you really need to do is just keep moving forward and solve problems along the way. Because I promise you, even if you check everything off your list, you'll wake up tomorrow to a hundred new problems you you never knew existed, right? And so I think the most important thing you can do is to get the ball rolling, move forward any way you can, and just combat, combat the problems as they come. Uh, and if you're able to do that, uh, I think that you, you'll, you'll be able to... Uh, achieve anything that you want, really. You know, obviously you need to start with a good idea, but uh, assuming that that's true, like don't let you get in the way of you and your success. Fantastic advice. Now, looking back at your career, I suspect that you've got more than a few war stories uh, over the years. So I've got to ask, are there any funny or interesting stories you can leave us with before we, uh, before I let you go? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier in the podcast that, um, you know, we got started and it was a community run initiative. But one of the other big things that really helped us when we started, and it just seems like one of those things that's completely dumb luck that you might see in a movie, or if you saw in a movie, you would think is completely unrealistic, is uh, early on in our in our process, we uh, actually I won't even say we our our uh, CEO and one of my co founders Sasha, he cold messaged chad hurley on twitter and if you don't know chad hurley is one of the co-founders of youtube uh, and he sent him a message saying hey we have this world we have this game and we think it's going to blow your mind something along those lines um and we want to show it to you and we thought oh you know like this is like an insane thing to do he probably gets a million messages a day and he doesn't know who we are uh but somehow he wrote us back and said okay yeah let's set up a call and show me what you got uh, oh yeah yeah <laughs> And, and, uh, and we, so we, we jumped on that call and we were just a bunch of, and still are really a bunch of excited. I want to say kids, but I just celebrated my 40th birthday. So maybe, uh, excited, not even young adults. I don't know, adults about this, this sci-fi world and all this stuff that we had created. And we explained to him the rules of the game. We explained to him the world. We told him the story and he, he fell in love with it. And, uh, you know, uh, the rest is kind of history. Having him, uh, he is now one of our uh, co-founders, basically. He is on all of our meetings, uh, like company-wide meetings. He's always there to to give advice, help steer us in certain directions. And of course, having him involved in the project added an air of legitimacy that, you know, we wouldn't have had if it was just the bunch of us uh, in our basement on, on a WhatsApp chat, you know? So uh, I'm always grateful for that. And I think that if nothing else, that story tells you... Uh, to just at least shoot your shot, you know, because you don't, you never know what the outcome is going to be. Even if it's a one in a million chance, sending him that message, we had nothing to lose. It wasn't as if, if he said no, it was over for us. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that is kind of crazy. And I, I hope anyone listening does not, does not now just inundate Chad's <laughs> inbox with messages, <laughs> maybe try a, a different founder of a different project. But, um, I will say that like, yeah, it's uh, it to this day seems crazy when I think about it, uh, but it's really how we got started. Wow, what an incredible story! And I was just going to ask as well that that none of us are able to achieve any degree of success without a little help along the way. And if there was a person that you're particularly grateful towards who might have seen something in you, but I don't need to. It's got to be Chad, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I am, I am uh, more than grateful, and he is also, um like one of the guys, you know, like he, he does come to a bunch of our events and, um, it's, it's not, he's not a hands-off 
kind of guy. He he is definitely one of the team, and I like him uh, as much uh, for his business partnership as I do for his friendship. Yeah, that's a beautiful moment to end on. But before I let you go, for anyone listening, just want to find out more information about Parallel, the games, anything we talked about, or even join your community, because I know you have a passionate community too. Where would you like to point everyone? I mean, I think the best place is to start uh, excuse me. I think the best place to start is our website. That's parallel dot life. Uh, and from there you can get to our Twitter and our discord, which I think are the two other big hubs of information. Uh, feel free to follow us at parallel TCG on Twitter and yeah, just, just get involved. The game itself, uh, while it contains NFT and ha- NFTs and has a whole blockchain element is completely free to play. So uh, I would say that if you're interested in trying the card game, um, then, you know, hit us up and try it and keep eyes on Twitter and Discord and our website for more information about the upcoming AI project. Fantastic. Well, I'll add links to everything there so people can find you nice and easily. And I encourage everyone listening, check out the community, check out the games and they're very welcoming over there. And more than anything, just thank you for taking the time to sit down and share your story. And that incredible story about Chad, too. Amazing. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Wow, what an incredibly cool conversation that was. And for me, today's discussion took us on a journey through the intricate world of AI and blockchain in gaming. And we delved deep into the nuances of Parallel's Colony Project, a fascinating fusion of AI interactivity and autonomy that is redefining player engagement. So I cannot thank today's guests enough for sharing his invaluable insights on Parallel's community-first approach, highlighting the power of collaboration in tech development. We also got a glimpse into the evolving landscape of blockchain and Web3 gaming. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on anything we talked about today. LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, just at Neil C. Hughes. Let's keep this conversation going. But that's it. I'm out of here now. Hopefully you'll join me again bright and early tomorrow with another guest. But thanks for listening today. And until next time... Don't be a stranger.